In this video, I want to present some ideas in philosophy of science that have been developed by Paul Teller in a series of recent papers. Uh, Teller is interested in how the complexity of the world conflicts with our traditional ideas of truth and accuracy. Um, so the assumption to start with is that we do have access to the world and that we form representations of the world that constitute knowledge. Uh, however, the complexity of the world outstrips our representational capacities, um, or in other words, the world is far too complex for our representations of it to be exactly right. And the question is how to make sense of knowledge in the face of this complexity. Traditionally, uh, knowledge is thought of in terms of uh, propositions. The standard analysis of knowledge is that knowledge is justified true belief, where what is believed is a proposition. Um, and, I mean, justified true belief, that's putting aside uh, technical problems like Gettier cases um, that you get in uh, epistemology. But, you know, that's the, the usual way of putting it. Uh, but what exactly is it for a proposition to be true? Well, take a simple sentence like A is P. Um, this attributes a property which is picked out by the predicate P to an object, the referent of A. Then the statement A is P uh, is true just in case the object does in fact have that property. So just in case the statement matches the world in the relevant sense. Well, that seems simple enough. Now let's put this a bit more precisely. An important component of any version of scientific realism is referential realism. The claim is that terms in scientific theories have non-empty extensions, and our best theories provide approximately true descriptions about the things in those extensions. So an extension is just the set of things in the world that a given term refers to. So atom picks out the set of atoms. Uh, you know, when, when we say atoms exist or there are atoms, another way to put this would be to say that the term atom has a non-empty extension. It applies to things in the world. Now, a term such as atom uh, is not, according to Teller, directly attached to its, to its extension, right? Like we don't simply point at things in the world and ostensibly label them atoms. Uh, after all, atoms are too small for any of us to observe. And even if we could point, uh, even when we can point at things, there would be a question of what exactly it is that we are pointing to. You know, when I point at various mountains and label them mountains, does the term mountain include the snow in its extension or just the rocks? Um, you know, that pointing isn't going to determine that. So the extension of a term, you know, the set of things in the world that the term picks out is determined by a combination of the, uh, of the meaning of the term and the conditions in the world. In particular, the term must specify some extension determining characteristic. Uh, which governs the applicability of the term. Uh, something is in the extension of a term just in case it has the extension determining characteristic. And, you know, I mean, either a given item has the characteristic or it doesn't. So the extension of a term is determinate and exact, even if we don't know exactly what the extension is. I mean, in practice, obviously, we don't know, like, the exact extension of atom because we don't know exactly how many atoms there are and, and so on. Um, but we take it that there is an extension of the term atom. The term has a determinate meaning, and with the meaning specified, it is a matter of fact, independent of us, what things count as atoms. So what things fall under the use of that term. Now, with this in mind, there are two ways in which the statement, there are atoms, might fail to be true. First, it could be that atom has an extension determining characteristic, but that nothing in the world has that characteristic. This is how most of us think of the term uh, witch or phlogiston or magnetic monopole. These terms are often thought of as having a precise meaning, but there's just nothing in the world of, to which those terms apply. Second, it could be that atom fails to be connected to an extension determining characteristic. Um, or maybe a simpler way to put this is that the term atom might fail to have a determinate meaning. And it's this second issue that occupies Teller. Our terms simply fail to hook up to the world in the right kind of way. Um, even when we're making statements that seem to embody knowledge of the world, 
because our terms fail to have the right kind of meanings, uh, or at least the complexity of the world outstrips the, um, the, the meanings of terms. What is the extension of the term atom? Well, there are many ways that atoms might be conceived, uh, might be conceived of. Teller says that the standard conception of atoms is of a nucleus with charge n, with exactly n electrons bound to that nucleus. But in fact, the vast majority of atoms are not like this. Molecules with ionic bonds are formed from ions, uh, not atoms in this sense. Uh, in molecules with covalent bonds, the electrons are shared. So again, the nucleus will not have a specific number uh, of electrons. Um, similarly, in plasmas, the electrons are no longer associated with any particular nucleus. Uh, the standard conception of atoms is really only true for like noble gases in particular conditions. It's an idealization. Now, this may seem rather pedantic, but the point is that the uh, extension of atom, the term atom, is indeterminate. And there are countless ways of making it determinate with no one correct way of doing so. What then can it mean to say that atoms exist? Well, it's a simplification. And similarly, statements involving the term atom, statements like hydrogen atoms have one electron, uh, water is composed of hydrogen and oxygen atoms, right? these are also all simplifications. They are not strictly speaking true, at least not true in any straightforward sense. Um, so statements about hydrogen atoms fail to pick out a determinate set of things in the world. Now we might think, okay, this is just the standard problem of approximate truth. All sensible realists already talk in terms of approximation to the truth, rather than in terms of truth simpliciter. So the usual claim that realists will make is that you look, even the, even our best theories of the world are not true, right? They're just approximately true, right? That's all we're saying. Uh, there, there are plenty of ways in which our theories are inaccurate and incomplete. And so once you bear in mind approximate truth, um, that's, that's sort of all you need to uh, account for this point about the indeterminacy of the meaning of our terms. However, the question here is how approximate truth should be understood. Uh, if philosophers attempt to analyse this notion at all, which, I mean, very often they don't, uh, a lot of them won't try to analyse it, but you know, when they do, um, they often still think of it in terms of the traditional view of reference. Um, so Teller quotes, uh, he says, uh, quotes Larry Loudon, a necessary condition, especially for a realist, for a theory being close to the truth, or approximately true, uh, is that its central explanatory terms must genuinely refer. The realist claims that the terms of our best theories genuinely refer. Those terms successfully pick out things in, in the world, objects, properties, and relations. Uh, Teller's point is that terms do not actually refer in any way that was uh, traditionally, traditionally thought. Note that it's not just scientific realists who will endorse referential realism. Uh, suppose we're constructive empiricists and we take it that the function of scientific theories is to systematise, predict and control the observable phenomena. Well, in that case, we will understand theories as being true for observables. And this will involve successful reference to observable things and properties. Uh, for example, what object in the world does Mars refer to? Well, the problem is that there are too many candidate objects. Um, does, does it include the atmosphere? Uh, if so, how much of the atmosphere? Where exactly do we draw the line around Mars's atmosphere and outer space? Uh, how do we account for identity over time? So we usually think that Mars is something that exists over a period of time, despite the fact that its properties may change substantially so that strict identity is not preserved. Uh, why is this one thing rather than a succession of different things? Um, so, you know, it, as a result of all of these problems, the world is far too complex for the term Mars to attach to one specific thing. This is an instance of what's known as the problem of the many. I recently uploaded a video on that problem, which um, you may want to check out for more detail. Now, <clears throat> so if, if knowledge is restricted to the observable, um, to what we perceive, well, that, this is again inexact knowledge. Uh, referential realism fails for the objects of perception as much as for anything else. 
Uh, so the, you know, the instrumentalist, the anti-realist may say that we have knowledge of observables, but this knowledge is just as idealized, um, just as simplified as our theoretical knowledge. Perception seems to present us with determinate objects, but we know that they have no determinate boundaries really. Perception presents us with objects with intrinsic colour properties, though we know that colour must be significantly relational, like dependent on the structure of our particular visual systems. It's also worth noting that the difficulty here is not simply a matter of, uh, of idealisation. So suppose we create a model of the solar system in which Mars is treated as a point mass. Well, obviously Mars isn't actually a point mass, but from this point alone, we wouldn't claim that, you know, that Mars in the model has no referent. The model Mars is usually thought of as having a referent, as picking out a particular planet. Uh, we identify it with the planet Mars, but we understand that we are idealizing for the purposes of model building. Idealization is, as Teller says, simplified characterization of things successfully picked out with the tools of reference. Teller's point, by contrast, is that our representational tools, the tools of reference, never really pick out any particular objects. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the, the, the issue is about how our, you know, how our terms hook up to the world or how our uh, models and representations hook up to the world. Now, despite all of this, we do, in fact, use the tools of reference to make claims about the world. And many of these claims do constitute knowledge. Teller suggests that truth and reference can be thought of as idealizations. So just as we can simplify Mars and treat it as a point mass, so we can simplify our knowledge of the world, treating it, treating it as if it were precise and exact. To provide a somewhat less idealized account, Teller appeals to what he calls semantic alter egos. There are two kinds of uh, inexactness. There, there are inaccuracy and imprecision. Any representation of the world will be inexact in both of these ways to differing extents. Um, there's a, there's a trade-off between the accuracy and precision of our representations, so that maximizing one will often mean minimizing the other. Suppose I say, John is six feet tall. Well, here are two ways of interpreting this. We might take this to mean that John is six feet tall precisely, or we might take it to mean that John is six feet tall close enough. So notice, right, J1, that John is six feet tall precisely, that's precise, but it's inaccurate because, I mean, nobody is exactly six feet tall. But we can treat this falsehood as if it were true, if John is in fact close enough to six feet tall, right? So although this is inaccurate, we can, we can kind of act as if it were true. It functions as a truth because it's close enough. It's, yeah, it's, it's close enough to what the truth is. J2 is true, but imprecise. Um, and we take this statement as true when John's height is close enough to six feet as to make no difference to our purposes. So a, a, a true imprecise statement, if made increasingly precise, will become false. Similarly, we can take a false statement and we can absorb the, uh, the falsehood, we can absorb the inaccuracy by removing the precision, and that will then make it true. And the key thing to notice is that both of these statements are assertable in exactly the same contexts. The false precise statements will function as truths. Uh, that is, they can be treated as if they are truths in the same contexts in which true imprecise statements work well enough and vice versa. So we may act as if people had precise heights uh, in contexts where we may ignore the discrepancy between John's idealized precise height and John's actual properties. Teller calls this the uh, principle of semantic alter egos. Uh, so J1 and J2 are alter egos of each other. Uh, Teller summarizes, inaccuracy and imprecision constitute two exchangeable facets of representational imperfection. And the two members of a semantic alter ego pair do the same representational work. We make true imprecise statements 
where the imprecision doesn't matter. In the same context, for the same reasons, we could use a false precise statement where we ignore the degree of inaccuracy so that it functions as a truth. You know, we can treat it as if it were true, period, true without any qualification. In this sense, the two semantic alter egos do the same representational work. Uh, another way to put this is that the conditions of application for the false precise statement and the true imprecise statement are the same. So J1 functions as a truth when J2 is true. Uh, now, as mentioned, the standard realist will talk in terms of approximate truth. So on this view, these semantic alter egos must be taken as approximating some fact of the matter. There is a determinate fact and we can make statements that are precise but false or imprecise and true about this determinate fact. But on Teller's view, the notion of approximate truth fails because there is no determinate fact to approximate. This is where uh, complexity enters. What could the fact be that is approximated by statements such as J1 and J2? Well, certainly there's no determinate fact about John's height. For one thing, height changes throughout the day. When you lay down, you'll get slightly taller because gravity will no longer be compressing your spine. But even when we look at John at a specific time, well, once we zoom in, we find that John has no clear boundaries. So there's no way of specifying what counts as his height. Uh, and then there are, you know, even if you could specify exactly which you know, particles constituted John, uh, there are difficulties like indeterminacy of, indeterminacy of position in quantum mechanics. Um, you know, particles just don't have precise positions when you zoom in far enough. So when we try to, so, so what we find when we try to make sense of the fact uh, being approximated, of the, of the determinate fact that is being approximated by our statements, what we find is that at every stage, attempts to understand what John's height could be are scuppered by complexity. The very notion of John's height is a simplification, and it's not a property that can be attributed to anything independently of our simplifications. So there's no fact here to be approximated. Right? There, isn't, there isn't such a thing as like the fact of John's height, the precise determinate fact of John's height to be approximated. This is a key point. When we say John's height is six feet close enough, it's tempting to interpret this as stating that there is a determinate property, the property of John's height, and, and then that this is close to six feet, right? I mean, and that is indeed one way in which um, our statement that John's height is six feet close enough could be true. But that's not how this actually works. Strictly speaking, there is no such object as John. And strictly speaking, there is no such property as John's height. Strictly speaking, the terms in the sentence simply fail to refer because no determinate object is picked out, no determinate property is specified. Even so, the world is very much like a simplified world in which there is a determinate object with a determinate property. Our world is uh, close enough to that simplified world as to make no difference. So given a certain set of idealizations and simplifications, we can make true statements about John's height. Um, but these statements can, cannot apply exactly to the world. Um, what we know of John's height is knowledge that is filtered through idealization. The same idea of semantic alter egos applies to the case of Mars. Um, we may treat physical object language as true, but highly imprecise, so that Mars refers indes indeterminately to a vague collection of things. Then when we say that uh, Verity visited the same planet as Sydney, because they both visited Mars, well, we allow some imprecision in the notion of sameness, so that identity does not require strict overlap of properties. Or alternatively, we can think in terms of an idealized model of specific persisting physical objects. In this model, there is a determinate planet with strictly the same properties over time. This model is false, but it functions as a truth for most purposes. How does all of this play out in the sciences? Well, a key aspect of science is measurement. Uh, the standard view of measurement is what Teller calls traditional me measurement accuracy realism. According to this view, the world contains systems which bear quantities of particular values. An accurate measurement outcome is a measurement outcome that is close to the quantity measured. 
Uh, suppose we're measuring the temperature of a glass of water and we say that it is 20 degrees centigrade, accurate to within a tenth of a degree. The assumption then is that there is a number that is the temperature of water in degrees centigrade and the measurement outcome is within one tenth of a degree of that true value. Uh, if we state this a bit more formally, measurement accuracy realism says there is in nature the quantity Q with the value Q in units U for object or type of object O. So again, think of the temperature of a glass of water or the mass of a lump of lead. Then Q star, a measurement outcome of Q, counts as perfectly accurate if and only if Q star is equal to the value Q. Uh, accurate enough if and only if Q star is close enough to the value Q for present purposes. And uh, we would say that outcome Q star is more accurate than outcome Q star star, if and only if Q star is closer to the value Q than is Q star star. Okay, well, that's, I think, fairly straightforward. That's the standard way of understanding uh, the accuracy of measurements and probably seems fairly uncontroversial. But again, the complexity of the world undermines this simple picture. Part of the reason for this is that the terms used in the statement of a measurement outcome and the terms for quantities and their values all, strictly speaking, fail to refer. The temperature of water in this glass has no determinate referent. Uh, it, has no, it has no particular referent, it has no determinate value. Um, time, mass, velocity, temperature and so on do not attach to determinate quantities and as a result there are no determinate values for them to have. So. Um, we might here try to fall back on, on intervals, right? We might say, for instance, that the temperature of the water is between 20 and 21 degrees. Well, this doesn't help for several reasons. First, um, this statement, the water in the glass, uh, that has no referent for all of the familiar reasons already pointed out. Second, um, this claim concerning the intervals, this would presuppose again that there is a determinate temperature, a true value in between those two points. And third, there is in any case no determinate interval. We can make any given interval increasingly precise, but we can never achieve perfect precision. Uh, indeed, there's no sense to the idea of a like perfectly precise interval wherein the like true temperature uh, ranges. Where we draw the lines of the interval will depend on the context, on how much risk we're willing to take on how much we trust our measuring instruments and so on. Here's another example um, discussed by Teller. Suppose we wish to measure the speed of sound in the Sydney Opera House, uh, let's say at 8pm on a particular day. Well, now there are a host of ways in which complexity intrudes. First, what exactly are the boundaries of the Sydney Opera House? I mean, we're measuring the speed of sound in a particular place, but what place? Uh, there are many different ways of drawing the lines here. Do we include the auditorium or also the vestibule, etc.? Uh, second, how should we specify the general conditions of the Sydney Opera House? Do we have the door open or shut? Do we have it with an audience or keep it empty? What things do we put on the stage? In practice, it's impossible to specify the concrete object that we're studying in complete detail. So there will always be indeterminacy in what exactly counts as the Sydney Opera House. And since there's no determinate concrete object, it makes no sense to suppose that it has a determinate value for the speed of sound. Any attempt to measure the properties of the Sydney Opera House must involve uh, idealizing the Sydney Opera House. Third, environmental conditions within the Opera House, however we specify it, will not be completely uniform throughout. Temperature will uh, change throughout the auditorium and this will affect the speed of sound. Um, consider also our understanding of how the speed of sound varies with temperature. When we say something like the speed of sound in air, that has no value because in order to say anything about the speed of sound, we must specify the condition of the air. So we would have to say, you know, the speed of sound in air at temperature T, at pressure P, and so on, filling in all of the features of the air in question. But if we suppose that these have precise values, then there will be no sample of air that actually, you know, actually has these values. This will be applicable to no actual sample of air, because no actual sample of air has 
perfectly uniform temperature T, perfectly uniform pressure P, and so on. So the speed of sound in air is another idealization, uh, no longer applicable to any real world phenomenon. When we measure the speed of sound in the Sydney Opera House, we will measure only the average. Um, to say what the speed of sound actually is throughout the Sydney Opera House would require uh, specifying the exact details of the air at each point and knowing how the sound interacts with air in this condition. Even if we bothered to do this, it would all be based on idealizations. Another point about measurement is that measurement requires units of measurement, and units of measurement are also idealized. Consider the second. The technical definition of the second uh, is this, that the second is the, uh, this duration uh, of so many periods of the uh, radiation corresponding to the transition between the two hyperfine levels of the ground state of the cesium-133 atom. This definition refers to a cesium atom at rest at a temperature of 0K. Now nothing has a temperature of 0K. Uh, this is a matter of principle. It's due to quantum effects, vacuum fluctuations. So in defining the second, we are considering an idealized situation in which these quantum effects do not occur. And this isn't just rare, it's impossible in the actual world. So you know we haven't even specified a like a determinate possible world here. After all, who is to say what such a world, a world without quantum effects, would actually be like? So this definition fails to specify a determinate unit of time. Uh, on top of this, the definition is based on theories such as general relativity and quantum field theory that are themselves idealized. Now, none of this is to say that measurement outcomes are just up to us, that there are no facts of the matter. Some values are reasonable, others are not. Uh, if I put you know, a thermometer in the glass of water, I read the result carefully, and I say that the temperature of the water is 20 degrees centigrade, well, that's reasonable. 40 degrees centigrade would be straightforwardly false. Um, and this is the case partly because of the meanings of our terms, partly because of the way the world is, and partly because of what is convenient given the context. It's useful to act as if there were such a thing as the temperature of the water in the glass. Useful to act as if it were 20 degrees centigrade. Measurement outcomes are never perfectly exact. There's always you know, some range, which is why when we're being more careful, we will report an interval rather than an exact number. But the key thing to note is that this, exact, this inexactness is not a departure from an exact property, as measurement accuracy realism would have it. Rather, these are departures from idealized values of idealized quantities that are characterized in idealized units. Um, that is, the measurement outcome is off by a value from what it would be in a simplified world. This is just the point that you know, there is no actual fact in the world. It's, it's useful to treat inexact measurement outcomes as departures from real values of real quantities characterized in precise units. In general, it's useful to think of the world as really constituted by these idealized values of idealized quantities characterized in idealized units. And that's why traditional measurement accuracy realism is so appealing. Traditional measurement accuracy realism is itself um, an idealization. Now, measurements are important in the construction of scientific theories, particularly in theory testing. Predictions are derived from theories, and those predictions are tested by taking measurements. But measurement is not itself part of the content of scientific theories. Um, a central part of many scientific theories, by contrast, are scientific laws. Um, I guess some theories might indeed be thought of as, uh, kind of, they might indeed be summarized as collections of laws. Now, the traditional debate concerning laws uh, is, that, is, is between what are called Humean and non-Humean accounts, or regularity theory and necessitarianism. I have a couple of videos on this uh, topic, uh, so on laws of nature, which explore this debate. Um, the shared assumption of both traditional Humeans and traditional non-Humeans is that scientific laws describe universal, exceptionless regularities in the world. And then the question is whether laws involve more than this. So for Humeans, laws are just descriptions of regularities, nothing more. For non-Humeans, laws somehow stand behind the regularities. Laws 
literally you know, govern natural phenomena in some sense. Um, again, you can check out my video on laws of nature for more details on this. But uh, the point is just that the shared assumption of both parties is that when we know a law of nature, at least one of the things we know is a universal regularity, a universal relation between properties. This picture of laws faces some rather obvious challenges though. Uh, it is a law that nothing can exceed C, the speed of light in a vacuum. Uh, the speed of light in a vacuum is proposed as a universal physical constant. But of course, there are no perfect vacuums in the actual world. Light will never actually travel at C. So this law does not rest on any actual regularity. It rests instead on an idealization, uh, the speed of light in a simplified world. The definition is based on stripping away the complexity of the actual world. Here's another example uh, discussed at length by Nancy Cartwright in her book, How the Laws of Physics Lie. Take Newton's law of universal gravitation. Um, so here, uh, F is the force between two objects. Uh, G is the gravitational constant. M1 and M2 are the masses of the objects. And R is the distance between their centers of mass. What this tells us is that two bodies attract each other with a force that is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them and directly proportional to the product of their masses. This law was a remarkable achievement. Uh, it was the first great unification of science, which brought terrestrial, the, the terrestrial phenomena of gravitation and the behavior of uh, astronomical bodies observed from the Earth under a single theoretical scheme. So yeah, a pretty remarkable achievement there. Does this describe a universal regularity? Well, no. Uh, one obvious reason is that there are always many other forces, such as electrical forces, acting on any two objects. So the force between them will not, will not be equal to this. Um, indeed, very often, uh, the, the law will not even be approximately true. In the interaction between I I electrons and protons within an atom, the electrical force will totally swamp the gravitational force. Uh, so stated plainly like this, the law of universal gravitation is simply false. It does not accurately describe how things in the world behave. The law of universal gravitation is subject to ceteris paribus conditions, uh, where ceteris paribus means other things being equal. Uh, more precisely, what we should really say is that if there are no forces other than gravitational forces at work, then two bodies exert force on each other as stated by the law of universal gravitation. Now stated in this way, um, the law is true, but it holds only in idealized conditions. It's not applicable to any real object because real objects are always subject to other forces, even if these are negligible. Uh, perhaps in many cases we can proceed as if uh, it were applicable. You know, we can ignore the other forces but there will still be plenty of cases where the other forces matter, such as the interaction between electrons and protons of an atom. So the law will not even be approximately applicable. Uh, Cartwright gives us a dilemma. Um, if we want to think of laws as describing reality, there are two options. We can state the law without the ceteris paribus condition, in which case it will be applicable. All worldly objects will be in the domain of application of the law. But then the law will be false because the objects will not behave as stated by the law. Alternatively, we can state the law with the ceteris paribus condition specified. And then the law may be true, but it no longer applies to anything in the real world because the ceteris paribus condition does not hold for anything in the real world. And notice that this point mirrors the trade-off between accuracy and precision, though, I mean, with laws, it's a trade-off between accuracy and applicability. Laws are always precise. I mean, at least the you know, mathematical laws of physics are always precise, but we face problems connecting them to the behavior of actual objects. Um, increasing accuracy will reduce applicability and vice versa. All regularities have exceptions and laws are both true and applicable only in idealized models. Um, laws work by allowing the construction of more specific models, which may be more or less accurate and precise for specific systems. So we can construct 
Newtonian laws. Um, you know, we can we can apply Newtonian laws to construct models of the solar system or models of a pendulum, and then these can be compared to real systems and used to predict and understand the behaviour uh, of those systems. Uh, again, there will still be significant idealizations involved in that comparison. One concern about Teller's view is that he might seem to be committed to straightforward scepticism. After all, Teller's position is that, strictly speaking, no theories are true, and they are known not to be true. Even apparently simple statements such as John is six feet tall are not, strictly speaking, true for a multitude of reasons. Surely then, uh, we cannot be said to know anything. Uh, despite this, Teller does not take his account to be a sceptical one. Uh, indeed, Teller describes it as a kind of realism. Uh, we do have knowledge of the world, a great deal of knowledge, and our best scientific theories provide the best access to that world. So why, why is this not just scepticism? Well, consider this, the case of uh, radical scepticism uh, of the external world, such as um, rain in a vat scenarios, right? Why do we reject these? Well, there are, of course, many responses to scepticism, but a pragmatic response is much in line with Teller's position. We need to begin by asking what the point of the concept of knowledge is. Right? What work is this concept doing for us? Well, beliefs of reasonable accuracy are important in order for us to get by in the environment. We need uh, to be able to identify food sources, threats, potential cooperators, and so on. Now, a great deal of our information about the world comes from other people, uh, and on any given topic, some people are more likely to be right than others. So we need to identify these reliable sources of information. Concepts of knowledge help us to track reliable sources and share information with others. Suppose that Verity and Sydney both look at a tree. Verity is a novice and so only sees it as a generic tree. Sydney is an expert dendrologist and immediately identifies it as a beech tree. Sydney can make reliable discriminations of different types of trees. Now, neither Verity nor Sydney can say whether they are really looking at a tree or whether they are merely brains in vats or somehow hallucinating the tree. But this just doesn't change the fact that Sydney is capable of making finer discriminations than Verity. So most people would be happy to say, Sydney knows it is a beech tree. The skeptic, of course, is unsatisfied. The skeptic will say that Sydney doesn't really know that he's looking at a beech tree uh, because he doesn't know that he's not hallucinating and he doesn't know that he's not a brain in a vat. Unless these skeptical possibilities can be ruled out, Sydney has no justification for his belief. But from a pragmatic point of view, these kinds of uh, these kind of possibilities are just irrelevant, right? So there are various contexts in which we need to consult people who can distinguish between beech trees and other types of trees. There's pretty much no context in which we need people who can distinguish the brain in a vat scenario from the non-skeptical external world scenario. Uh, after all, uh, if we buy the skeptics argument at least, then making this discrimination is impossible. So presumably there just are no such people. But then, you know, there's no practical utility in seeking out such people. It's, you know, it would be a waste of time even looking for them. In denying, then, that Sydney knows that it's a beech tree, uh, the claim will be that the sort of pragmatist attitude will be that the sceptic is using a concept of knowledge that is of no relevance or interest to any project in our lives. If knowledge requires ruling out sceptical scenarios, then, yeah, scepticism is vindicated. But in that case, uh, knowledge, the concept of knowledge is just sort of, well, it's just useless. Uh, so scepticism is itself an uninteresting position. Um, in this situation, we simply would not talk about knowledge, right? Uh, what, what matters practically uh, is that Sydney is a reliable source of information and we can draw on his information in conducting various projects. And then the question would be, well, you know, why would anything more be required for knowledge? Uh, to insist on more is to insist on a concept of knowledge that will be of no practical value and of no interest. Of course, for any claim that we make, it's always possible to continue inquiring further. We can always ask for more evidence and we can always try to rule out uh, increasingly outlandish theoretical possibilities. There will always be 
alternative explanations for any given evidence. So we might say that, strictly speaking, you can never know it's a beech tree because there are always further possibilities to rule out. But practically, inquiry comes to an end sooner or later. Uh, and of course, we, well, we never need to speak strictly. So along the same lines then, strictly speaking, it's not true that Sydney is looking at a beech tree because of the failure to specify a determinate object, because of the uh, vagueness in the terms Sydney and beech tree and so on. Again though, at some point we have no choice but to cease inquiry. Eventually the, um, the gain that may be made by increasing precision or accuracy just isn't worth the, uh, the increased cognitive costs. Whether or not a claim is counted as knowledge, or whether or not a claim counts as true, will depend on the context, on what our purposes are. For almost all purposes, uh, it's perfectly acceptable to say that I know that John is six feet tall. Uh, you know, is it true that John is six feet tall? Well, it's not precisely true, but it's true enough. It's true within a certain set of idealizations that you know, we apply all the time. Given a particular way of classifying people, given a particular way of measuring height, given certain standards of accuracy, we can come to a consensus on the claim that John is six feet tall. And there can be no reasonable debate about this. It would not be reasonable to claim that he's five feet tall or seven feet tall. Um, so, you know, taking John to be six feet tall is not going to lead us astray. Taking him to be five feet tall or seven feet tall would do. Uh, so, you know, think of contexts where you're trying to calculate John's body mass index or where you're trying to design a costume for him or where you're looking for dates with men taller than you. John is six feet tall um, given, so it's, it's true enough, given the standards of precision and accuracy that are sufficient for us to successfully achieve our aims. But of course this means that as contexts change, uh, so will knowledge claims. Um, indeed Teller even suggests that there's a reasonable sense in which in the past commoners knew that the earth was flat. So consider people who spent their entire lives in a single environment, who knew of no other places, who had no concern in you know, long range navigation and other such activities. When they used expressions such as the earth and the world and so on, these applied to the environments that they were familiar with. They had no theoretical knowledge of the earth and the wider cosmos and they, were con they, they concerned themselves with practical activities like farming. Given this context, it was true enough to say that the Earth is flat. Just as we might say, quite correctly, that the Great Plains are flat. For people living on the surface of the Earth, especially if they're confined to a single location and they have no way of like stepping back and seeing or thinking about the Earth as a whole, um, it's true enough that the Earth is flat. That's a relevant property given the way in which such people interact with the Earth. So that is, uh, given how these people in the past interacted with the earth, the kinds of activities they performed. Flatness was an imprecise way of representing a relevant property of its surface, and this representation would not have led them astray. Today, we do not know that the earth is flat. Why? Well, first, because our standards are much more exacting. Uh, we have greater general knowledge of various environments of the earth. We have a more globalized society. We think about the earth from more points of view instead of just interacting with one relatively small patch of land. Uh, even classrooms often have globe maps or photos of the earth from space. So, you know, right from childhood, people are like taught these relevant facts. And I mean, these kinds of facts actually matter practically because, you know, we do things like send satellites to, to orbit the earth and so on. You know, this matters. Furthermore, of course, there are uh, th there is the problem in our society that there are some flat earthers. There are people who uh, share our standards and interests and perspectives, at least broadly speaking, but who come to utterly crazy conclusions. If we were to say that it's true that the earth is flat, that could easily be mistaken as an endorsement of flat earth theory in the modern sense. So we do not know that the earth is flat. We know that the earth is a globe. But that, of course, is also an idealization for uh, reasons already discussed. Um, you know, the Earth fails to have a referent. And even, you know, if you could specify a referent, it's going to turn out that actually there are many different ways of uh, uh, modeling the shape of the Earth. Um, 
Just a simple browse on the Wikipedia page for the figure of the Earth will uh, reveal the many complexities that are obscured by simple statements of the Earth's shape. Uh, there are yeah, lots of different ways of modelling it as a sphere, an ablate spheroid, a geoid and more, and all of these will involve idealisation. The general point is this. Knowledge of the world is always knowledge through idealisations. All our claims about the world get things wrong in one way or another. The complexity of the world undermines the referential element of realism. But we may often treat unsuccessful reference as if it were successful. We can treat our terms as if they picked out reference, uh, reference objects in the world, as if they had determinate extensions. And then we evaluate a representation or true or as, as true or accurate when it works well enough in the context for all relevant people and for all concerns that are likely to arise. Truth and knowledge then are not simply a matter of opinion and we do have truth and you know, we do have knowledge but neither are truth and knowledge uh, fixed and independent of us. Knowledge is dependent on our standards of precision and accuracy and in this respect all knowledge is provisional. Our standards may always change and you know that of course is one of the factors that drives the uh, increasing accumulation of scientific knowledge. So yeah that is uh, basically um, basically the kind of view that has as I say been developed by Paul Teller uh, in a series of recent papers and that's all for today. Thank you for watching.